Hello everybody, it's Philly Cuts with another hub day all oh, number 78. You know where every week I get together with you guys and I go over the overpriced stack of new comic books I get every week. We got some doozies this week. I got a ton of stuff from DC. That's primarily what the haul is. We got three number 50s. Three number 50s. Now, I'm not sure how many number 50s came out this week, but there certainly is going to be a ton all month. And uh, I haven't been doing too much research on it yet, but I guess DC is going to be rebooting many of their books again, I guess, for Rebirth. Um, which, uh, I don't know, it feels kind of a little, uh, overboard, I guess, because a lot of the books have gotten rebooted again, you know, with the whole convergence event, post-convergence, so I haven't really looked into it that much, to be honest with you. Um, I only know a few things. I know that, uh, action comics and detective comics will eventually be going back to their original numbering, so both of those comics are going to be close to, like, issue a 1,000. So I think in the next couple of years, or maybe even a year, I don't even, I don't know, both those books will be hitting a 1,000. So that's pretty exciting. And then I think all the other books are going to, like, start over again, from what I understand. But again, I didn't do my research. I apologize. So if anybody knows more down below, let me know. I guess on March 25th, DC will be announcing... The uh, creative teams that are going to be assembled on all these different books. So, let's get started, folks. I got Action Comics number 50. Now, these are all double-sized books. Thankfully, for not double the price, they're going to tack on an extra buck, as you can see there. four ninety nine, so an extra dollar, but it gets you extra pages. This book continues the Savage Dawn storyline which i forget what they're up to it's got a rival this batman super heavy storyline which has been going on for like nine or ten parts now at this point uh one of the themes in a lot of the dc books that i've been getting is kind of uh you know speaking of rebirth big changes that all the characters have been going through like superman uh has been depowered uh we learned that Vandal Savage is the one behind it. Vandal Savage uh, has become immortal. That's his backstory. Uh, granted powers to him by this comet. Now, Vandal Savage wants to once again harness this power of the comet to gain even more strength to rule the universe, right? That's what everybody wants to do in the DC universe, right? Rule it. Um... He had to acquire certain pieces of places that he put together in order to attract this comet uh, into the Earth's realm area so that he could once again harness it again. So he did gain possession of Superman's Fortress of Solitude and the Justice League's Tower, and I think he had one other thing, and he kind of created this weird-looking ship here that is going to attract the comet to him now the interesting thing too in this book is that superman or in the savage dawn story is that superman uh found out that you know part of what was depowering him was that he had these cells that were dead all over his body and they were kind of blocking out the power of the sun uh you, if you, we all know that Superman gains most of his power from that yellow sun. So he had to basically bathe himself in kryptonite in order to kill all this skin that was preventing the yellow sun from being absorbed. Uh, it's basically like a chemotherapy to kill this these bad cells and to rejuvenate the good ones. But... He's running the risk of like kryptonite poisoning, and that's been kind of the result here. So it's kind of cool, kind of different themes going on here. It's kind of cool that uh, they have Superman kind of trailing around with Green Lantern trails, at least in the last couple issues anyway. Uh, but, you know, sometimes I feel like it's got to be careful what you wish for, right? I really do kind of miss 
the fully powered Superman. You know, I'm getting a little tired of seeing Superman running around in blue jeans and a t-shirt. You know, it's getting a little, little tiring. Uh, but again, this is the last leg of Greg Pak and Aaron Cooter working together. So that's kind of sad. This is the third to last story in this arc. It's going to continue in Wonder Man or Wonder Man, Wonder Woman, Superman number 27, and then it will conclude in the big Superman number 50. Uh, the artwork in this is, is interesting. Um, it kind of changes quite frequently, and that is because in this book alone, there's like five inkers and three colorists. So it really kind of uh, changes throughout the book. I mean, there are some great sequences in here. I don't really want to spoil it for you guys, um, but near the end of the issue, there are some great like full panel pictures and two panel layouts, so it's really, really cool. Uh, I'm enjoying where the Superman story has gone to an extent, but like I said before, I'm definitely ready for Superman to come back and be full power. Now, we got another number 50. This one, we have Detective Comics number 50, and it's in this poly bag. And I guess there's different variant covers in here. So we're going to open this up and uh, find out what's in here. Now, this storyline has been following Commissioner Gordon as Batman, right? The Mecha Bat. And he's been involved in this murder case with his buddy, Harvey Bullock. So it's been kind of a classic detective case, which is cool. Kind of them breaking down, you know, the facts, searching for clues, really doing a lot of legwork, and really putting the detective in detective comics. So it's kind of cool, right? All right, let's see what we got here. Looks like, oh, no. Oh, there's some boards in here. Never had that. Okay. Interesting. It looks like we got a Superman cover, Superman Batman cover, I guess, to commemorate the pending launch of the Batman Superman movie. And it looks like it's half penciled and then to like full colored work. So that's kind of interesting. Man, look at how beefy they both look. They both look pretty beefy. So there we go. There's my variant cover there. Kind of a play on the Harley Quinn covers, right? That came out where you could get an inked one, a penciled one, or a fully colored one. So, like I was saying, an interesting serial killer case, right? Uh, the first couple murders involved the killer dressing up the guy, his victim as George Washington. Then his next victim was dressed up in an astronaut suit, I guess to simulate the first astronaut that went up into space. I don't remember who the name of that is. So that Harvey and Commissioner Gordon started to hypothesize, okay, so this is a serial killer and he's dressing up the bodies to mark certain firsts, male firsts in history. And then all that kind of got thrown out the wind when the next victim uh, was going to be a woman. I think she was dressed like Joan of Arc. Um, and I don't think she ended up being killed. So this is kind of going through a rogues gallery of different history, stuff like that. Pretty interesting. Um, I don't know what all this is about, but now we're seeing a guy in a dog head suit. I don't know if that's the killer or not, but I thought that was interesting. I didn't have a chance to flip through this issue because I just opened it up with you guys, as you saw. But lots of different stuff. Lots of Knights of the Round Table stuff here, too. So kind of a different take on killing. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how that goes. Uh, I think there's also a backstory in here. Um, near the end, there's a whole bunch of different uh, panels through time with Batman here. Great, great pictures here in the back. Um, sorry my camera isn't really picking it up well, but there's about, I'd say, almost 20 of these, like one-panel pictures showing Batman through various uh, phases here. Interestingly enough, it seems like Batman through different phases of torture, it looks like, almost. Here's a cool one that I like. I don't know if these are old covers or not. There's Batman in the 
toy box, it almost looks like. Some demonic toys tearing them up there. So pretty cool. I like that one as well. Almost looks like a Red Baron kind of thing there. So, all right, Detective Cox, number 50. All right, Catwoman, number 50. And I'm really enjoying this story uh, by Frank Thierry taking over the writing duties. This is the final story of the arc. Uh, Catwoman has been commissioned by a mysterious Mr. Blonde. He's the benefactor. She doesn't know who Mr. Blonde is. To steal the Frost Diamond. Well, lo and behold, Catwoman gets framed for murder, and she ends up in prison, where Orange is the new black. That's what that totally reminded me of, this picture of Selena Kyle, her hair dyed blonde. There she is, dead center. And she's got to get her way through prison. Catch is, is that some of the people that want to kill her, because there's now a bounty on her head over this whole diamond thing, are in prison with her. And she has to do battle as well with the likes of Clayface and Calendar Man. So pretty cool, dude. Pretty cool. But I got to ask, you know, Catwoman is a super burglar, right? Is she going to be able to get through, get out of this prison with little to no problem? I don't know. I would kind of think so, right? It's kind of like the plot of that Sylvester Stallone Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, right? Remember they designed prisons and then... They're put inside the prisons and they got to break out. wasn't a very good movie, but that's kind of what it reminded me of. Now, the cool thing in this book, too, is that we do find out who the identity is of Mr. Blonde. And I'm going to tell you, it is a triple A lister in the, in the DC universe. I'm not going to say who it is, but it is a triple A lister, meaning very, very high. <coughs> Excuse me. Ugh. On the DC Universe hierarchy. Um, there's also a couple backstories in this as well. Two different stories. Night at the Museum. Kind of shows a certain artifact that Catwoman needs to get into possession of. And then also kind of a comic relief type story involving the Justice League. Intruder Alert. Now I gotta say I'm really, really enjoying the artwork of Anaka Miranda definitely has some unique uh, panel layouts that I really, really enjoy. Um, just fun. Just a fun-looking book. Interesting panel layouts. Like, check out that fight sequence. I love it. I love the different blades. Slivers of the blade and a knife fight. And, oh, man, Selena's looking great, dude. So I'm really glad I stuck with uh, Catwoman. And I plan on buying that in the immediate future. Not stop. I'm just going to keep going. All right. Another Batman Superman comic. Tom Taylor doing the writing. And this is another murder mystery of cosmic epic proportions. Batman Superman have found this dead lizard girl. She's giant on uh, the moon. And it turns out that the person who ordered this murder, it's just downright wrong and downright sinister. And your jaw is going to drop when you find out who it is that murdered this lizard woman. I mean, I almost feel sorry for her. But there's also some cool backstories going on in this as, as well, mainly... Uh, Lobo versus Batman. That saga continues. Now, in the last issue, Batman fucked up Lobo. Basically took his face off. And I'm not sure I remember why, but Lobo, who normally does have crazy, crazy healing powers, think Wolverine, right? Uh, he is unable to repair his face right away. So Batman really did a number on him. I don't remember if Batman did his homework and uh, figured out a way to prevent Lobo from healing himself quickly, but his fucking face, half of it, is straight up hamburger. Looks good enough to, well, no, maybe not good enough to eat, but good stuff. Good stuff. And there's good, uh, the good thing about this is, is that if you want a fully powered Superman, it's in here. If you want 
Bruce Wayne as Batman. It's in here. It's in this series. I don't know, you know, what timeline this is taking place in, but fucking Lobo versus Batman. I mean, come on, dudes. That's enough for me. I just, I hope that when they do rebirth or whatever, God, I would like to see Lobo come back. Um, I don't think Cohen Bunn will be doing the writing, but I think he did a pretty good job. Uh, and I really enjoyed Lobo, and I enjoyed the tie-ins uh, Lobo had with the Green Lantern universe. So I'm hoping, I'm praying that Lobo does come back, at least in some capacity, other than, you know, appearances in other people's books. All right, now we have the IDW Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Batman crossover, and this is a fanboy's wet dream, right? Originally, Batman felt that the Turtles were the bad guys, but it turns out they weren't. So the sides have been properly aligned. We do have Batman now siding with the Turtles. We have Shredder and the Foot Clan kind of teaming up with the Penguin. They need the Penguin in order to get uh, a certain piece to this device in order to send the, the Foot Clan and Shredder back to their world. Uh, there's been some trans interdimensional portal that has been opened up. That's why the Turtles have ended up in Batman's universe. Uh, there's some good stuff that's about to happen in this book. We're getting a sneak peek of Arkham Asylum, and we all know the Joker periodically has a, you know, ends up in inpatient there, right? Ends up in inpatient. So I can't wait to see the Joker tie, and, you know, you had to know that this shit was going to happen. Uh, at the end of the last issue, uh, Ra Al Ghul uh, teams up with the Shredder. Now I'm wondering how strong will that alliance be? Is it going to crumble under pressure? But the cool thing is, here are the Turtles hanging out at Wayne Manor, and there's Alfred getting them their pizza. Pizza dudes. Looks like they got about 15 pies there. They end up having a sesh with Batman, a combat session, with Splinter looking on. Remember when they fought last time, it was a pretty much a draw. S Splinter actually stepped in, broke him up. Uh, this one, kind of cool, kind of practice -y. not really fighting each other, but cool nonetheless. But check this out, man. I really enjoy the lightheartedness that Tinian adds to this with Batman enjoying a slice of pizza with the turtles. And the turtles kind of get to a nice little speech about how pizza is a way of life, that in order to have fully lived, you must enjoy a piece of pepperoni pizza. And I totally agree with that. And uh, I love pizza. All right. Casey Jones is coming too, folks. Isn't that a great picture? The artwork of Rob Williams is definitely growing on me. Uh, definitely much more stocky build for Batman, which you know I'm not a fan of. But I think that the Turtles and the other characters look great. I mean, the Turtles look wonderful, man. And I don't know what he's using here. It looks like he's using some pastels for the Turtles. But they look they look great, man. They look great. And I can't read Casey Jones in here. It's going to be pretty fucking sweet. And I know that when Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, the movie, comes out, that Casey Jones will be in that as well as Bebop and Rocksteady. So pretty, pretty sweet. Okay, more Tom Taylor. We got the Green Lantern Corps, Edge of Oblivion. Now, when the last issue ended, we had Kilwag duking it up against Guy Gardner. And I would like to know down below, anybody that reads Green Lantern, who do you think would win? Guy Gardner or Kilwag? I, I would have to put my money on Kilwag, man. Kilwag is just a fucking straight up beast. He's a beast. There's a little preview. Yeah! Beast, man. He is a tank. Those two are scrapping with one another because there's been some deaths in the Green Lantern Corps. There's been B-Dig, who's the little squirrel dude, and Muck Muck, the fish, and Akasira have all perished. They've perished. I loved B-Dig. B-Dig was so helpful 
to the other Green Lanterns in the last series, Lost Army. He helped them get out of that prison, basically. I mean, if they didn't have B-Dig, where would they be right now? So, the Lanterns are on this dying planet. It's the last living planet uh, in this parallel universe that they're in before time. Remember, the, all the Green Lanterns in our current universe are gone. And that's left Hal Jordan alone without any other Green Lanterns, right? Um, they don't have much time to make it off this planet. I guess this planet's dying. They have a matter of days. There's this giant race of people that live on this planet that they need to decide whether or not they're going to help them. And one thing about the Green Lanterns, they're always altruistic. They're always, uh, you know, the good of the many over the good of the few. And I have to think that they're going to help this race of giants. Um, uh, I just have to. The artwork in this is incredible. You have uh, veteran Green Lantern artist Ether, Ethan Van Shiver. And I believe, let me see, I took my notes here earlier. I believe, yep, he is leaving uh, the, after this book. He's, he's gone. So I don't know who they're getting in for the artwork after this. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. But he just draws the best Green Lantern stuff, man. I mean, when I think of Green Lantern, I think of Ethan Van. And uh, I'm enjoying this, and I can't wait to see where this series goes. I can't wait to see these guys re reunited with Hal. You know, I'm ready to have the Green Lantern Corps reunited with Hal Jordan. Uh, the whole renegade thing has kind of run its course with me, man. That's the thing. I think like DC, it's almost like be careful what you wish for, right? I mean, uh, it's just part of me feels that DC maybe has tried too hard and has tried to alter, you know, the fundamentals of these characters just a bit too much. And it's time for the rebirth to be a return. So I'm hoping that's what it is. All right. Finally... DC, I got Constantine the Hellblazer, number 10. Now, the last issue, he was in hell, in a city of hell, Diz. And it was Neron who uh, brought him into hell, going to torture him. Constantine, he's a slick fellow, right? If there's one thing about Constantine, he knows how to work his way out of a jam. Turns out that a certain demoness that he used to have a relationship with named Blythe, uh, he was able to finagle, runs into her down in hell. He finagles her into helping him break out. Well, it turns out he gets out of hell, and he ends up in this place known as Fairy. Yes, Fairy. And it's like a fucking My Little Pony convention gone mad here, dude. There's bronies. There's all kinds of fairies and shit. There's unicorns that bleed blood. Do you see that? Rainbow-colored blood. And crazy dudes are drinking it. I don't know, man. It's just weird. And it's this world inhabited by a whole bunch of pranksters that just like to rave. I don't even know. Is that what you kids call it these days? Raving? That's what they called it back when I was uh, maybe some of your guys' age. Not that all you guys that watch me are young. I know I have a very eclectic audience. But he has to find his way out of Fairy in order to stop Neron, who kind of wants to unleash hell on Earth up in New York City and open the floodgates of magic, and it will just turn New York on its head. So pretty cool. I can't wait to see where this goes. Uh, we definitely have uh, some new artists working on this. Travel Foreman is the penciler, and Joseph Silvi Joseph Silver is the inker. Ivan Palencia continues with the coloring, but uh, yeah, the artwork is definitely different. There's Neron, definitely different. Um, but I'm I'm enjoying this book, man. I like Constantine. He's like this anti-hero. He's kind of like. Oh, I don't know. It's almost like he's kind of a guy that's sort of forced into these situations. He doesn't really want to do it. But when the time comes and he has to step up to bat, he gets it done. And I'm really enjoying it. And I'm glad that I started buying Constantine. Uh, Descender, Image Comics, number 10, Boy, Tim, 
Boy Robot Tim 21. There he is there in his full robot glory. Uh, Tim 21 has made it to the planet of the machine moon. And this is home to the robot resistance. Okay, so imagine a world where robots are despised, where they are hunted and destroyed. Uh, I'm not going to get into the reasons why. I've done it a million times. Watch some of my past comic book hauls if you're late to the show. Anyway, Tim21, uh, it's revealed that the robots on this harvest moon, on this machine moon, they want to access Tim 21's dreams. Why? Because they think buried within Tim 21's dreams is the location of a shadow server that contains the memories of all the robots that were slaughtered during this great robot purge. It's suspected that they want to, you know, gain access to these memories and create more robots and lead and Tim 21 will be like the Jesus Christ of robots and launch a second coming on the rest of this universe uh, the United Galactic Council so pretty pretty heavy stuff if you enjoy a book where each issue the world continues to get fleshed out it continues to grow the relationships between the characters continue to deepen uh, for example, Tim 21's human brother is hunting him. He's what's known as a scrapper. That's a person in this world that is a robot bounty hunter. Uh, interesting, interesting stuff. Uh, in last issue two, uh, we were introduced to a new race of people called the In Between, and they're kind of uh, like cyborgs, you know, part human, part uh, robot. Dr. Kwan, who is one of the creators of the robots, actually now has a robot arm, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's just great, man. It's just great. The artwork by Dustin Gwynn, these watercolors, is probably the most unique-looking book that uh, I'm reading right now, which is great. It's kind of like this minimalistic look here. But it works, man. It works. Uh, it really sells the universe, and I'm enjoying it. And this probably right now is my favorite image book, my favorite independent book for that matter. Uh, the other cool story, too, here is that Tim21 met like his cousin, Tim22. And I have to wonder if there's some kind of nefarious motive of Tim22, you know? They got to access those dreams, baby. So really interesting, real heavy stuff. And then finally, Cullen Bunn, Harrow County, number 10. As you can see on the cover here is Bernice. That's Emma's friend. And this story basically delves into the backstory of Bernice. I hope I got her name right. I think I did. Yes, Bernice. Kind of shows Bernice with her family, what she's all about. Tyler Crook does an amazing job with the artwork. Uh, last issue, we had a guest artist. It was female. I can't remember her name. She did a really great job. But the hallmark of this series is definitely Tyler Crook. Uh, great, great stuff. And this is the kind of series where uh, Colin Bunn really shines. You know, like, I think that this is really uh, a near and dear story to him. Uh, him being from the South and... Uh, I think that a lot of this is probably influenced by maybe some of the stories that his old man told him, you know, the haunts, the haints, and uh, it just works, man. This is definitely where Colin Bunn excels. This is no Aquaman, let me tell you, and uh, I'm going to stay on board with this book for quite some time. All right, dudes, let me know what you're liking, what you're disliking, and actually, I think that this book is taking a break. No, I'm sorry. Descender, this is the final story of this arc. It's going to be taking a break until June. So, bummer. All right, anyway, let me know, guys, what you're liking, what you're disliking. Let me know down in the comments section below. I hope to do a shout-out video soon. Appreciate all you guys' viewership, and I'm glad that every week you're letting me come into your home to talk about some comics. Uh, cover of the week. Boy, oh, boy, man. It's... it's it's been some tough weeks here, 
But I think I'm going to go with uh, Superman, dude. Superman Rising. Nice and simple, but uh, definitely giving me what I want, dude. I'm, I'm ready, dude. I am ready for a fully powered Superman. I'm ready for fucking Bruce Wayne to return as Batman. I'm ready for Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern to be reunited. So let's keep our fingers crossed and uh, be thankful. All right, dudes? Bye.